Good evening, everybody. Hope you're well today. And it's five o'clock in Perth. It's eight o'clock in Melbourne. Delighted to see you all here today for this inner circle um, group session. And um, yeah, I just want to make sure everything's working. Can you just let me know you're hearing me and seeing the screen? Okay, that would be sensational. Cheers, Rod. Thanks, David. Good to see you again, mate. Good day, Wayne. I am well, thank you. All good. Right, let's get things started then. Okay, let's just put up this uh, slightly dated disclaimer, but the rules of the game are the same in that these are opinions of Mike Smith and not necessarily representative of Go Markets. And uh, of course, it is. Um, we are looking at live charts too, so please bear that in mind that it is for educational purposes only, not for uh, any or shouldn't be construed as advice to take any trading action individually. You've got trading plans to guide your every move, I'm assuming, at this stage. And of course, risk management is a critical part of everything we do. So that important message being shared, let's just, of course, have a look at what's going on with markets. and. Really, it's um, it's an interesting uh, interesting day in that there's one event is dominating market thoughts today, and that is uh, the Fed Reserve two-day meeting will be finalised today. Later on tonight, in the middle of the night, if you're on the East Coast, and uh, Fed Chairman Powell will not only release the interest rate decision, which is likely to be no change there. Um, barring something completely bizarre, then there'll be a policy statement attached to that where there'll be a sentence or two and the language will be picked apart by market participants to see if there's any change in any word which might indicate um, any change in thinking. And then, of course, there's the big one, there's the press conference run by Fed Chair Powell about an hour into trading. Now, we're in a very sensitive market state at the moment. We've just come off a couple of weeks ago, of course, we had that major pullback. Um, in fact, a correction, if you look at the NASDAQ, most asset classes move significantly. We've got some buying into the US dollar, and this is all on the back of that um, treasury yield move on the 10-year note in the US. And we talked about that extensively a couple of weeks ago. But essentially, that upset markets. And since then, over the last week, things have stabilized, uh, and that is less of an influence now. However, um, dependent on what comes out of uh, Jerome Powell's mouth will be influential in what happens to those yields immediately and the market's perception of inflation and interest rates. Now, just to put things into context, we are at record highs. Or close to record highs in all of the major US indices apart from the NASDAQ, which is still recovering a little bit. We have had at the last week of pretty um, pretty strong movements. The ASX is just trading in a sideways range as it appears to have done for the last few months. Um, DAX is trading near a record highs. So that's the context we're, we're in with all of this. Um, so if the news does come out that perhaps there is a concern about inflation, Although the data last week was um, very, very soft, uh, and that may impact to some degree on timing of potential interest rate rises at some stage during 2022 or even 2023, then the markets will move accordingly. We'll see a sell-off in equities, we'll see an increase in bond yields, and away we go. If the language appears to be extraordinarily accommodative or there is the hint that the, that the Fed may actually intervene on treasuries, then um, we could see a positive move. At this stage, I think the former is more likely than the latter. And I think the chances of status quo, um, it, it really is flick of your coin stuff, flick of a coin stuff. So that's really what's dominating market thinking right now. And hence today has really been almost a write off in terms of clear direction, we had a pullback in the Asian markets. ASX ended up down about 0.8%, just as people took money off the table, took risk off the table and thinking, 
this is too hard let's just see what shape the world is tomorrow so very little movement in currency pairs um and very little movement in the futures let's actually check out the futures right now you should see them on your screen um and you can see really the, these these haven't changed at all really since the start of the day you can see how the flat line within a flat range we've got the five minute chart on there really really flat so for most of the day up and down of neutral i was probably slightly stronger than it was earlier but only marginally so russell has been about 0.5 percent down since about an hour into asian open um if you look at the look at the european futures you can see there virtually flat as well the vix has risen and risen significantly this VIX contract um, simply because of that expectation of some action happening look at the currency pairs there's very little going on there a little more action than there was we're actually seeing some selling of the yen and the canadian dollar uh, even the commodity based currencies so the really it's the gb pound and the usd that are particularly strong um something's happened with the aussie dollar recently we'll just have a quick look at that but copper is more than half a percent up gold and silver pretty static so you can see the general picture not much movement in oil so the market's just waiting it's in waiting mode no movement in the yields yet as we can see there on the yield futures contracts um quick look at the economic data that's coming up so we have got um we've got some uh, trade balance figures coming out of the eurozone is this actually that's tomorrow let's try again so we're on wednesday so um yeah so we're waiting for some inflation data out of europe in the next hour um the bund auction i'm not sure whether i'll have an impact on treasuries it'll be interesting to see but i'm not think, don't think it will got some housing data early on in the us just before market open and then here we go this is stuff that's going to move markets not necessarily here although the policy statement if that's got a change in wording we may see something there but it's this press conference around about um around about half an hour after the release of that um interest rate decision that's gonna get the attention of markets significantly so what's that nine hours from now uh okay that's about one that's about 2 a.m my time 5 a.m your time so maybe if you want to get up early and see the action that could be interesting if you're very keen anyway uh, right, so that's put everything into perspective. As I said, um, in terms of uh, today's, oh, come on, Mike. in terms of today, I'll just put CNBC up just so you can quickly see. Um, so if we look at Asia, Nikkei flat, flat Shanghai, flat Hang Seng, uh, Cosby a little shy, and there's oh the ASX actually recovered right at the end about five percent down um but really uh if we look at e the uh european markets look at that flat 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 a little bit of movement on the footsie but nothing significant so um yeah caution across the board we'll just have a look at some charts we'll just check out go right back to the start you can see i was doing a cfd session today um, we we'll look at the US 500 daily. That's where we are, just to put context. So really, we've been around this 3970 level for um, for the best part of three days, if you include today. Not a great deal of movement. The US dollar, uh, you can see we pull back on that equity market strength. Um, but over the last three days, as this Fed, mark, uh, Fed meeting has approached, you've just seen the US dollar regain a little bit. There's the Russell, been the weaker of the indices over the last couple of days but still now uh, this is record highs we're talking here and we are about 1.2 percent from the highs and um, the only one of course that's been a bit of a laggard has been the nasdaq which has actually done pretty well of late uh, you can see there we dropped 11 percent from top to bottom in that correction and then after that day where it sort of 
flapped around a little bit at the bottom, then we've had a steady yet significant move higher to to really close to really sort of retrace about 50 or, or regain about 50 percent of the losses that we had uh, that sort of three weeks ago or so so the nasdaq's been a good place to be um for that reason uh, and outperformed that the last two days has outperformed the other indices okay gold and silver with that usd strength we would have been expecting gold and silver to drop off but they haven't we've got this situation of uncertainty again you can see gold hasn't really moved um, if we look at opens versus closes, 0.75% from top to bottom in the last four sessions. Silver is much the same, I think about 1%. Uh, but really, we've got established resistance lines in place, which um, uh, which have been adhered to. Um, so, but expect some movement across everything later on. If look at the VIX. This is obviously a different fixed contract to that shown on. Um, uh, to that shown on Finviz, the one shown on Finviz is usually the next one that's due to expire. With CFDs, you tend to see futures contracts that are two or three contracts away. Just that that means that the at the end of one contract, the beginning of another is slightly smoother, which means that there's less price fluctuation, um, which is really it's just a, a reflection of of contract rollover rather than market sentiment. So that's why the, there's longer dated futures contracts on CFD contracts. But you can see there, even still, um, we touched the bottom there of around about 1966, and that move up to its high today was about 5.4%. So it reflects, um, there's two things. First of all, you can see it's at a low that really has been a support for quite some time now. Uh, but secondly, um, it does reflect the movement in the shorter term futures contract we saw on Finviz as well. Hope that clarifies that. But market looks comfortable at this stage, although a little bit uncertain today. That's why we've popped up a little bit, but expect a big spike in that if we get something major coming across. ASX 200, as I said, trading within a range as it has been really since uh, mid Jan, apart from a couple of little twitches up and up and down, but really still in that range. So um, not really shifted at all. China 50 has been interesting, but this is what we're seeing time and time again. We're seeing a triangular picture. Uh, there's a symmetrical triangle on the China 50, trading within a range. Again, but you can see it's coming to a point. Again, so we should see some movement in that later. Uh, but certainly if you're short with this, now would be the time to get out if you look at the MACD there. Now, let's look at some currency pairs with that US dollar. It's going to be very quick because really, not much is going on if you look at the euro usd essentially what we've got in place we've got a support in where the 200 ma is and we've got a resistance in at this point here okay you could suggest that this is a key level where we're trading now so this is the daily chart remember so i could say that this is a key level i think the 200 ma is probably the one to look at which is about another 39 pips below uh, and as I said, we've got some resistance up here. Around about that 90, 1964, 120 appears to be a critical level. Nice round number, market likes that. And you can see it tested down uh, last week. Uh, really hasn't done so this week. Uh, we've just seen a gradual drop with that move up on the US dollar index. Um, the US yen. Let's drag that on. Uh, this has just had an incredible run higher. I mean, it broke one six, now we're up to 109 quite staggeringly. And this, just to put it into context, represents a high not seen since beginning of Jan 2020. Um, but even then, uncertainty is starting to creep in. You can see now we've got a resistance there at 109.15. Doesn't look as though it's got the motivation yet to move higher. Uh, we'll see a change in that later in the session. On the downside, just watch this level at 108.25. Um, might be worth a penny order placing there, perhaps, if you think the Fed are going to uh, annihilate markets. Uh, look at the GB pound uh, USD, going to be very similar to the um, in terms of we've found a key support level, 
oh sorry key level to trade around so there it is that's uh, 139 dead so you can see it again it's looking triangular we could put a symmetrical triangle on this seems to be using the 20 year uh, sorry the 50 ema as support so again we've got a line here that we'll be interested in perhaps if it broke uh, short term uh, a, a reasonable distance to that if you're feeling uh, aggressive but you wouldn't really get into it to there so you're restricting yourself to around about 47 pips so that 139.45 might be worth an inch it doesn't look as though it's going to go anywhere near that for right now we have got a couple of down bars in the last couple of hours um, and in fact this level here looks more under threat but that too choppy going on for me that um but if it does break perhaps again significantly to the downside there's possibly 45 pips in that aussie us not that dissimilar um in terms of very very similar looking to the uh, gb pound us we've got a resistance here we've got triangular sort of pattern going on here um really in, real indecision and wait and see if you want to trade the shorter term chart Oops, as though there could be an opportunity to the downside kicking around now if we just take this out um, so it looks to be around about there where we're testing now around about 77.20 but to me there's not a great deal in that that's that's easy there's a 21 pip to the next level maybe 44 pips if it, if it continues but all this action around here and here before we got this reverse head and shoulders just looks messy to me uh, and it, it would feel like forcing a trade perhaps um, unless you're trading very short time frames trade the 15 minute chart perhaps um, then you've possibly got um, a chance of picking up that 20 pips that might be about the only way to trade this with any reasonableness um, even outside um, those pairs uh, we look at the Aussie yen uh, let's look at it on an hourly chart we do have a short-term level of interest which has been tested now but again we break this we've got 38 pips maybe 30 maybe 25 pips to the downside that could be worth a look at uh, the kiwi yen and these are all really short-term trades you wouldn't want to have all these trades open um, anywhere near where the fed is uh, there's your line in the sand uh, for the next level down so again you're going to scrape out 16 pip not worth it not worth the effort not worth the aggravation so that's where everything's at it's in that almost every chart we looked at there we're not sure we're not sure we're not sure um, market uncertainty is just the order of the day and you can understand why because this is what happened three weeks ago okay and there's that there is that threat of bond yield increases again and uh hey chris hey shane good to see you all here by the way guys um right so I hope that's you. So if there's any you, you want me to have a look at, then let me know and I'll come back to them later or later. <coughs> but let's get on to the order of the day, which is really about peak performance. So um, there's many of you have attended the uh, attended the, the last intermediate trader clinic, which went really well. Um, I was really quite pleased with how well it seemed to go down, um, firstly, and, and, and secondly, um, and secondly, how much people said they got from it. Um, so really happy about uh, about those sessions. Um, but one of the things that uh, came from that is is uh, we talked very briefly about a couple of things <coughs> to do with being in the right state to trade. And so I thought I would. We have briefly mentioned this in the past, but not given it any real airplay. So I thought I would put that right, <clears throat> give you some reasons why, um, give you some reasons why it's important, give you some what you have to have in place to make it happen, and, and also, of course, um, 
give you some uh, ideas on things like uh, trading agendas. Just checking. Uh, can we get recorded on Monday session? Uh, Andrew, drop me a line. Did you do the first session, Andrew? I wasn't, I'm not sure. Um, if you did the first session and you received the email on the Friday um, before the second one, then um, so in fact, if you're registered, you should have got that email on, on Friday. Then the link that's on there will get you access to I'll put both recordings on the same link. Uh, so if that helps, that's good. If it doesn't, yeah, okay. So if you got that email, as I say, it was sent, pretty sure it was sent Friday. It's the same recording link for the first for the first one as for the second. If you can't, just put me a, li a little line through. Okay, so look, this was um. As I said, I went back to I went back to the start with this, and I um, I sort of waded through the research on on peak performance generally, or or optimum performance, as some people call it. Um, and there's been an awful lot of research done on this, not in the trading context, of course, but across many many fields, such as athletics, or sort of high performance athletes, high educational performers, uh, high performing business leaders. So a lot of empirical research has been done on, on what this is all about. What creates that state of peak performance? And much of the research concentrates getting into a particular state of mind, where which can be called an optimum state, you know, it's often been termed as being in the zone, or a flow state. So you often hear people refer to themselves as being in the zone, uh, and often hear people refer to themselves as being in the right flow to, to, to do things. This is what it's all about. And this state occurs when a person functions at his or her fullest capacity with their attention completely focused around a task. And this is not only um, not only a state of being, but also a state of doing. Okay, so it's it's to do with thinking, feeling, and actions subsequently. Because the, the three in this context seem um, seem inseparable, uh, and the research is invariably concluded. Every single paper I looked at, and every single I looked at a lot of um, literature reviews as well, where they they look at many different papers, and without exception, it appears as those who were able to get into such a place performed a higher level than those who don't. So I thought I'd pick that apart because that's what I do, and try and put it into a trading context. Because logically, trading is a high intensity in some cases and a complex decision-making environment. Um, then having the ability to put oneself into a optimum state would seem to be advantageous. You all want to be high performance trading athletes, don't you? Now, this is the slide that you may have seen me use before. And this is something that was based on a bit of my own research into past clients. There was, a, um, there was about, uh, about 150 clients of, of mine. And I asked them sort of questions about the, where they were when they started to trade and, and how their results were doing, et cetera. Uh, a few more questions about what educational background they had and how often they traded, et cetera. And that's, um, uh, and this sort of seemed to fit with a model um, that is is out there that suggests that there are three sort of places. Um, and there needs to be a certain level of arousal or a certain state of being, which is the optimum state to be in. Okay. If you don't get to that state, you're too inactive or you're too relaxed about it, you don't really care you're not committed to talk about one of the big things we talked about at this um, at the psychology sessions, then you would be in this hobby zone. Then of course, there's the hyper emotional states that many people find themselves slipping into, uh, which, I, which I've termed the capital danger zone, which is, starts off with a state of, of trading anxiety, um, builds and builds into a major anxiety state and perhaps even panic, anger, and you'll have heard people talk about revenge trading, so this fits in that. So somewhere in the middle is the right place to be. Okay, so it's more than a feeling, it's to do with, it's to do with 
where you are in terms of your thinking, your comfort, your confidence, your um, and all of the things that put you there and the information you have to hand and then ultimately moving yourself into this place where you can perform on an optimal level. And of course, a failure to get in this state may result in a lesser trading performance than if you didn't. So that's all very well and good. So that's what you've seen before and that's what I've talked about before and I've talked about a couple of things that are relating to that. But I thought I'd take it to the next level. So what I did then is, I, again, there were, there were three or four key research papers that seem to really drill down on this um, that have had big volumes of, of, of high performance individuals. And what I want you to do is focus on the left hand side of this. I should have animated this, sorry. Um, and there were several characteristics that came up again and again and again. So what I've done is I've listed these characteristics, removed all the ones that are less applicable to trading. And then what I've done is I've tried to say, well, what, what do you need to have in place to be able to be in this good decision-making state? So first of all, one thing that came up again and again was this idea of a challenge skills balance. So this occurs when an individual trader has the required knowledge to be able to do what they need to do in whatever market conditions they find themselves in. Because without this, without that knowledge, without that confidence in learning, then they're going to be in a place where they feel uncomfortable, out of control, and even move into a state of anxiety, particularly when they see their money moving up and down, or they reject trades because it's too creates too much anxiety. The second is to have clear purpose and goals, and and this refers to the general purpose and your goals you set for you as a trader, let's say for the next three, six, 12 months, which are all to do with trading development, which incidentally, there's a two-part webinar series on trading development. I'm gonna really gonna absolutely smash it. I'm gonna nail this big time and really give you, give you all a plan of action based on what I'm doing in one-on-one -on -one coaching that's gonna take you and your trading to hopefully the next level, irrespective of whether you're trading discretion with a discretionary orientation or with an a or ea orientation there's some things there which are commonplace but also it incorporates the presence of the presence of some confidence in your underlying systems and again this is one thing we talked about at that session at that two-part session we did uh, monday and the previous monday that confidence in there's two two areas of confidence which are completely crucial um, to move you forward as a trader. There's what's termed self-efficacy or confidence in self. Um, and that's all to do with where your knowledge is, your ability to control anxiety, the the um, the uh, abilities to put, uh, to take control, that idea of locus of control, which we're going to talk about again in a moment. Um, but also the second area of confidence is confidence systems, which is all to do with producing evidence that your system is the right system for you. And we talked again uh, about your, your results aren't being simply a, a barometer. Uh, I'll call it, we call it, I think we call it a trading barometer for how successful or otherwise your interventions are. And that's all it is. As you're growing as a trader, it's not really about hitting it, smashing it out of the park every five minutes. It's about using your trading balance to help you devise the system that's right for you. And this goes for you EA guys as well. Your balance is almost irrelevant while you're developing your systems. And as you tweak those systems, you can then tell, well, looking at my trading barometer or my trading balance, is that change for the better or for the worse? It's a slightly different way of looking at results psychology, but we again, we talked about that to some degree there and then clarity and integration of current operational context now that's a very big gobful uh, but i couldn't think of any other way of putting it but that's all to do with awareness of the trading environment awareness of where the market is we talked about market iq and that's really where this sits uh, and the potential considerations and impl implications of, of of the actions you take so or the consequences if you like so we look at the markets now as we've just described and we've talked about 
What are the driving factors? What's driving sentiment right now? And where is the market sitting as a result of that? And then what could be the next thing that could happen? And the risks, the potential consequences of that. So as a result of that, I took some risk off the table today. I found out probably a few more positions open than I should have, and I just took a few of them off the table. Thought, nope, there's a fair chance it could move either way. It's might as well take my money down the track if I'm going to leave all these positions open. I'm going to take some off the table, bank in the profit, and took a small loss on one and um, left just a couple open. So that's uh, an example of how that information, how that market IQ, and what we talked about last week when we're talking about matching market circumstances to strategy and um, to strategies that you and instruments that you may trade, um, that all sort of ties in with that. And then if you are trading intermittently throughout the day, there's some things you need to reset because obviously the market may change and the market tends to change at those key opening hours of the different exchanges. So of course, there's the early morning drama in Asia, then there's the European excitement uh, on that open. And then of course, we move into the US um, in a couple of hours time. So three characteristics, there's gonna be more, three characteristics of a flow straight and what you need to get into that place. Uh, and this is where the, the, the ultimate crux of this matter is. <laughs> no, no, I'm not gonna mention it yet, Ross. <laughs> but um, what, what does it take to get here? If this logically is a good place to be, then what is it gonna take for you to be in that place? We have a calm, confident decision making. You're in that ultimate trading state every time you switch on your computer or look at your mobile phone and see what the markets are doing. Obviously, there's an acquisition of appropriate knowledge to make sure that challenge skills balance is right. And that obviously goes to not trading beyond your level of competence. If you haven't traded indices before, they are priced and they move in very, very different ways to share CFDs or to FX. So what you need to do is you almost need to press, when you're learning these things, don't just assume that you'll be able to position size the same, the price the same, they'll move the same. You have to test this stuff out before you do it. And as well as that, learn the idiosyncrasies about that particular vehicle. So that's an example. And that's what an example of that, like trading within your competence. If you don't know what an indicator does, it shouldn't be on your chart, okay? That's simple. Because your job, one of your responsibilities as a trader is to say, what do I need to add or take away from this plan that I'm using to make it better for me, to make it serve me as an individual trader in a better way? You can't possibly do that if you don't know what the things on your chart are actually telling you about market sentiment. So there's, that's not trading within your competence, okay? And then of course, your clear purpose and roles, what it takes is, um, I've talked before, I think many times about having a trading purpose, um, which is just why you're trading in the first place. One of the first things I get people to do if I'm in a one-on-one -on -one coaching relationship with them is say, well, well why are you doing this? What's, what's your purpose for it? What difference is it, are you hoping this is going to make to your world? Then, I haven't talked about this a lot, but I used to, it used to be a, an integral part of teaching beginner traders was to talk about having a trading code of conduct. And now I'm moving back to it again. I'd let it, let it go um, because it's sort of in, but it, essentially it's a rule. It's a rule. It's almost like a, a set of standards, a set of trading standards. So I'm always going to have risk management in place. I'm not going to trade. Uh, I, I'm going to trade at a specific level before I scale up. I'm never going to risk more than X percent of my trading account. I'm not going to have more than X number of trades open at any one time. I'm not going to expose myself to uh, to more than two currency pairs with the same with the same uh, with the USD. Okay. So it's essentially a list of rules. I'm going to journal every trade I make. I'm going to follow my trading plan religiously. So it's just simply a set of rules. And what I used to do with people is get them to write these rules out and then put them as wallpaper on their 
on, on the computer. So as the computer, as I switched the computer on, it was the first thing that popped into the head or popped in front of them was bang, there's my rules. Now I can look at the market. So maybe think about that. If you haven't done that, then maybe think about a code of conduct. And of course, you need a, co a comprehensive, clear, unambiguous, specific trading plan that covers every aspect of a trade from idea to execution to exit. And of course, then you have, as we talked last week, um, if you want clarity about where the market sits and what the implications are for that as you as a trader for today, and perhaps on an ongoing basis, then that's what whether all that market IQ stuff comes in. And what this mean, what you're trying to ascertain is what this means in the context of risk and opportunity. And does that mean I may trade any differently as a trader in this particular session? Uh, so second characteristics of a flow state is concentration on the task at hand with a focus on the present. Now, why I say that is one of the things that uh, with every decision, as I've said before, there's an emotional component and there's a thinking component. Now, one of the erroneous, I don't know whether that's the right word or not, but let's use it anyway, thinking, uh, emotional components is, hmm, I've been in this place before, I traded this pair before, I traded this stock before, or last time the Fed spoke, this happened. And this happened, therefore, should I be doing this or not? Okay, now, there's nothing wrong with that as a little sort of angel or devil on the shoulder, just giving you that little bit of, mm, are you sure about this sort of vibe? But you need to acknowledge that those past experiences and the emotions to do with that and the way the market was last time this happened may not necessarily be important right now. It's happened in the past. Oh, you can make a judgment as to whether it's the case now or not, but invariably it's not. Invariably, when you, that, that little devil pops on your shoulder, it's not really anything that's relevant to right now. Unless, of course, you made a, a, a what I would term a preventable trading error. So last time I entered a trade like this, I got in too early. I'm going to wait until it is actually half an ATR above that resistance level and the candle in the top third with increased volume before I actually get into this. So the only relevance of past experiences to right now, to you as you open that computer in the morning and start having a look at the markets, is the how those past experiences have contributed to knowledge and systems. It really is that. That's it. If you take that, put it in its right place, then you can concentrate on what you need to do right now. Remain focused, remove the distractions, and be in the good place to make decisions right now, be in the optimum trading state in that middle zone. Okay, the next characteristics is calmness and decisiveness at appropriate action times. You need to have that consistency, that balance of emotion, irrespective of what the outcome may be. If you've got a trading system that says this is a signal, you trade that signal. Remember Nigel Hawks came on a little while ago at the conference, he said that one of the big mistakes that he's seen and he did it took him years to resolve this, was he didn't take every single signal. Um, so it all has to do with confidence and execution at the planned action points. And to do that, you've got to have that balance of emotion, all of those other things we've talked about already. Now, we taught locus of control um, before. One of the things that gets you into this state of flow, this optimum trading state, is the feeling of being in control. Okay, we talked last week, oh, again, this psychology thing about the concept of locus of control. I'll talk about that a little more in a minute. But we need to feel in control of what's happening. If we relinquish our control to the market and what the market does, and that's where... Um, so rather than trading our system, we try to second guess the market about what it might do next. Will it go up? Will it go down? <clears throat> then we're never in a good place and there's really good outcomes from that. And then finally, I've just put in a physiological and emotional comfort. So if there's stuff going on in your world that means you shouldn't trade, you're not well, there's other stuff going on that should have your attention, 
then uh, you don't trade. It's really simple as that. So what will it take? Well, the first one, that concentration of task in hand, just um, be aware of one of the biases that we talked about called recent, that we've talked about previously is recency bias. We tend to remember the past experiences that aren't really that far in the past. We tend to base our trading performance on what's happened in the last two weeks. So if you've had a miserable, if you've had a miserable first couple of weeks in March, then you'll be joining a very large club. Does that mean you're a bad trader? No, all it means is the market's been difficult for your particular system and maybe you need to go back and have a look at your system again or perhaps look at some of the things we talked about last week with matching market conditions to to, um, to particular to, to particular strategies. Um, beware emotional anchoring past feeling to past events. Um, what happened in the past, the feelings associated with that aren't you now, they are in the past. And of course, we want to, as much as possible, get free, like absolutely like a new puppy rod. <laughs> um, as far as possible, we'll have freedom from distractions. Now, I recognize for some of you, this is hard because you have uh, other things going on in your day. Um, so you need to find a system that manages that. Okay, so it may be that 10 minutes, 15 minutes, because that's all it takes to get that market picture, to put you in the right place, to realign with your purpose, realign with your plan, which I've talked about before and I'll talk about again later. Maybe that is um, what you do before you get to work. So you've already got that knowledge, that information before you even enter the office door. Or maybe you program into your work day 15 minutes where you take a break. You don't answer, you get somebody else to answer the phones. You say, right, okay, this is my break time. I'm going for a cup of coffee. And at that stage, you just have a look around the market. You've got a system for doing that. Hey, guys, if you're not, um, what I'll do tomorrow, I did it before and it seemed to go down well. On tomorrow's market live session, I'll go through the process again that I use in, in terms of the, the, the market sort of overview stuff, if that'll be useful. Um, okay, I'll do that. Uh, Chris, I can do that. That's um, I've got a, a space. Just drop me an e can you drop me an email at, at Mike at um, uh, mike.smithatgoldmarkets.com and we'll have a chat. Just let put your, pop your phone number on that. We'll have a chat about that. Um, calmness and decisiveness. We talked again about confidence systems and confidence self or, or self-efficacy as it's termed as a trader. This is going to help that calmness and decisiveness at the appropriate times. And obviously, we need to control the things you can and acknowledge the things you can't control. And really, there's only one thing you can't control. And then finally, with that physiological and emotional comfort, give yourself permission not to trade. When it's not the right time, the market's still going to be here tomorrow, um, then uh, we'll all be good then. Cool. Right, uh, okay, so there we go. So those are characteristics of a flow state So, uh, and what it takes to do that. Oh, now, oh, forgot to say, um, I've copied all these slides onto a handout there. So if you look in handouts, because I'm a nice guy, I've put that already there. So um, you've got these to take away, have a look at, let, 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 let them process a bit more uh, and, and help you along the way. As I realize, um, I do tend to give a lot of information or education on these sessions. Just want to spend a little minute on locus of control. Just for those of you who weren't at that psychology session, so it's described as being internal or external. If somebody has an internal locus of control, they feel that what happens to them is, is a result of their actions. Now, somebody who doesn't has an external locus of control tends to feel, <coughs> excuse me, tends to feel that their results are uh, just because of the market. Okay, so what you're doing is you're transferring the power, transferring the control over to the, what that happens to the market. Um, and invariably, those with an internal control do significantly better in any walk of life. Um, if you take control of, of what you can, recognize that interventions can influence results, and no matter how small these interventions may be, and of course, here it comes. And of course, the best way 
to measure the impact of various interventions is to have your training barometer, um, make some changes using your training journal, comparing past results versus your potential change, and then you'll be able to see the outcome. And if you don't do that, you're selling yourself short, okay? If you don't have a training journal, that's the truth. That's the bottom line. There you go. You'd miss it, you'd miss it if I didn't say it, wouldn't you guys? <clears throat> so what can you control? Well, you can control what you learn. You can control the systems you develop, you review and amend on evidence. You can control your time, the way you measure performance. You can control execution on entry into trade management, so trade stop, uh, trail stops and exit, and of course, the size of the position you take. And you can always control when you trade and you don't trade. So you have control of all of these things. Why give them away and blame the market? If you're not giving them away and you're still not getting good results, then it means you have to do some more learning, refine your systems, and perhaps look at other ways to um, other ways that fit you more appropriately as an individual trader. The only thing that you're not in control of is price. Is what happens to price? We try to stack the odds in our favour with our systems and increase the likelihood a trade goes our way and of course subsequently manage exit well that's that's all we can take control back of price so why give any of that away it's not to do with the market it's to do with you and if you don't have a good few trades even if market conditions were not were different then what does that mean you should do? Does it just mean that next time the market conditions are like that, you do exactly the same thing, get exactly the same results? Or does it mean you look back at what happened during those market conditions and is it something wrong with your strategy? Is it something that you could add that's going to mean you don't get the big drawdown? Is it something that you need to that you need to take away that's getting in the way of your, of your trading? Because equally, I mean, if you've got 17 indicators on your chart, uh, it's probably too many. You should start to look at taking some of them away. So anyway, that's a little look. It's control deviation. I did promise to talk about a daily agenda. This is a set of habits that you develop that will serve you when you're trading because essentially it assists you in getting into this optimum trading state, reduces the risk of minimalization bias, so that is making decisions without complete information, it creates a tick list of must-dos, and there's three key steps. Okay, check. Step one is checking on your potential uh, trading state. Uh, before you look at the market so i'm not going to invest a lot of time with this there are things that are going going on in your non-trading world that mean you're not in the best decision making state leave it move away it's going to be there tomorrow or the next hour or the next week the markets will always be there so that's number one number two realign with your trading purpose and plan at the start of your trading day so as I said before, I'll give you the example of the, of the trading code of conduct. You should have your, your trading plan, your written trading plan, not the one that's in your head, the one that you're writing down, you actually should be trading by the place where you trade. If you trade at work, slip it in your top, uh, the top desk of your drawer at work. Your trading purpose that hopefully you should have written about why you're trading, what the difference it could make, and what that means in terms of behavior to get to that place you should also be realigning with that. It should take you two minutes to read a trading purpose and probably about three or four minutes just to remind yourself, because you know your plan anyway, just to remind yourself of your plan, just to help put you in the right space to take the right action at the right time, putting you in the zone that you need to be in. Because we know that in the heat of the market, we sort of look at prices going up and down. Ooh, now we're sort of 80 bucks in profit. Should we take this off or should we not take this off? Or 800, depending on how they position size. So it's easy to get sucked in by price, and by doing this, it helps reduce the likelihood of that. And thirdly, make a judgment on what to expect. So every day, the market will throw up different challenges, there'll be different drivers, there'll be different price movements, volatility differences, new economic information all influencing market sentiment, not only now in this moment, but also potentially for the rest of the day. And the market gives us clues about what that might be. 
So we take the time to make an overview judgment on what's happening and adjust our decisions on timeframes traded, risk levels we trade, or chosen strategies that we talked about last week accordingly. So for example, that concept that we discussed last week of adjusting risk, if you think the market is in a high risk straight and yet you still see a, a, a very, very good chart, then maybe you enter it, but you enter it at half a percent rather than a percent uh, risk of your capital. This is an undoubted potential attribute of the experienced trader. So it's gonna take a little while um, and that's one of the reasons I do that market watch thing, do the live update. Hey, if you're not in the live update thing, let me just get the link for that actually while we're doing this stuff. Um, where we go. If you wanna be warned of the 64 tomorrow and you're not in that already, I'm gonna put that into chat. That's 12.30 Melbourne time. If you want to rock up to that, that'll be cool. Oh, while I'm on the subject of, of, of topics going forward, next week, we've got magnetic trading going down. They're going to talk about what's happened. So they trade seven different strategies. And they're going to go through not only their historical results, but what's happened recently with those trading strategies. And they're going to give you uh, one of their end of, they've got three trades that work at the end of a particular period. They're going to give you an end of the quarter trade to have a look at because of course we are getting near the end of the quarter. So don't miss next week's session. Um, so we're creating a story to help us along the way. Now, one last thing I want you to do before we go, um, I've talked quite a lot and I just want to give you a little bit of a break before we finish up. Um, the guys in charge are always asking me, well, how do, how do, we, um, how do we tell whether, the, whether what we're doing is making a difference or not? Do we run a big survey, a big postal survey? And I said, well, no, I'll ask the guys. I'll ask the guys who regularly rock up to stuff and see what they think. So if, if you wouldn't mind um, answering a couple of questions, that would be fantastic. Um, so first one is just about the amount you're trading. You're trading more, are you trading about the same or trading, uh, trading less? If you're trading less, oh, sorry, if you've just started within a circle, then obviously, um, you'll not have enough uh, time to um, to make that judgment. But if you wouldn't mind answering that, that would be sensational. Thanks, guys. So we're half you've done so far. I'll just leave you um, leave that open for a couple of seconds. In some cases, oh, thanks, guys. Three quarters of you voted. That's sensational. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, one more. Now, just extract yourself if you've been attending sessions for the last month. Um, but if you've been here for a little while, just watch your results looking like these days. Are they slightly better, slightly worse, about the same? Uh, it might be dramatically better or dramatically worse. But again, if you can just give me a, a feel for it. I, this is good for me because it's sort of, um, obviously one of the things we've been doing with these intermediate trading clinics is really trying to sort of nut down on what makes a difference. Um, so again, um, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, guys. That's fantastic feedback. I really, really appreciate your participation in this. That's great stuff. Awesome. <laughs> Fire and Bridgestone tonight. <laughs> uh, you're welcome, Alison. And great to hear. So really. Um, those that's your trading agenda. So you should, but your daily trading agenda should be taking into account those those three things. First of all, making that judgment on you. Where are you? Are you in the right place to trade, or do you just leave it for now? Secondly, as I said, you realign with your purpose and your plan. Make sure you're in a good place. And thirdly, make a judgment on the market's condition right now and what impact that has on things like the timeframes you're gonna trade, the risk level you're gonna put in, or the strategies you're gonna trade. Meanwhile, of course, meanwhile, of course, what you need to do is work on those things that we talked about today and you get them in the handout. Um, as I said, look down that list. Remember we did, um, let me just flick back through before we hand it over to you. So these sort of, look at these characteristics of a flow state 
and look at what it takes. And maybe this is a guide. Maybe this is a framework for you sort of saying, hey, look, I'm not in this place yet. Or maybe this is something that I'm falling down on a little bit. I'm selling myself short. Maybe that's the next thing to work with. Okay, so have a look down that list from the handouts. Um, if you've problems downloading the handout, for whatever reason, I know some of you watch it on a mobile device, which may make it diff difficult. I'm um, not quite sure how that works with GoToWebinar, but by all means, drop me an email and let me know um, that that's the case. And I'll, um, I'll subsequently, of course, send it through to you. So, okay, so we're bashed through a number of different things there. Um, I've sort of, as always, I've tried to tell it how it is, not how you'd uh, like it to be potentially. So um, there's no soft soaping in tonight's session. So look, I, I hope you'll sort of take on forward. Uh, as with all these webinars, one thing I would suggest is before the dust dies down, you get back to back to what's a normal, the rest of your normal evening without me banging on in your ear uh, or in your face, of course. Uh, then. Maybe jot down one or two or even three things that you've either taken from this webinar or you're committing to doing. That's the sort of thing that makes a difference. Because all of those things we talked about in terms of that optimum trading state are applicable in your learning, are applicable in your system development. So you can have an optimum development state and you can have an optimum um, optimum learning saying it's exactly the same things because what you're doing is you're saying this is my trading this is my trading state that I'm getting into here this is going to serve me whether I'm developing a system whether I'm developing a uh, whether I'm learning some stuff about trading or whether I am actually in the trading environment so take that on board as well I forgot to mention that before but just to slip it in right at the end just to give you even more work so make a list of those things that you got from this session and uh yeah move forward with power guys thanks ross really appreciate that uh all good um okay just one last little thing again I've, as i said i'm really starting i'm really trying to um i'm really trying to push up deleted one of the polls i'm annoyed about that because it's my just evaluation poll um because I'm, I'm really sort of reviewing a lot of the stuff I'm, I'm doing, taking it to the next level, recognizing that some of you have been kicking around for some time now um, and kicking around some time with some, some good outcomes from it, uh, which is fantastic to see. So, um, yeah, so I hope that's been useful. Uh, as always, drop me any feedback, any thoughts you have, anything that you thought I didn't cover that you'd like covered in the future is always welcome. I'd much rather these sessions are driven in terms of topics by you than just by whatever comes out of the scary mind of Mike. Um, so please feel free to drop me an email on that as well. That would be fantastic. Um, and of course, enjoy the rest of your evening. Trade safe, watch out for tonight. Please watch out for tonight. Thanks Rod. Um, cheers Chris and Shane and Bob. And Rosalind, looking forward to hearing you smashing out the ballpark. Thanks, Ewan. Awesome, David. Um, you guys take care, hey? Enjoy the rest of your week and your weekend. There isn't much of the week left, of course. We'll see you, see some of you tomorrow morning, of course. Tomorrow, tomorrow morning, my time. Tomorrow lunchtime, your time. And um, in the meantime, take care of yourselves. Enjoy. Catch you later. Bye-bye for now. Shari, you're very welcome. See you later.